How you doing? I'm so happy we have a nice warm day again today. Isn't it good? Finally, we're ready for spring weather. So I'm Teresa Carlson, and as she said, I run our public sector business for Amazon Web Services. Who knows about AWS in here? Anybody? Oh, good. I feel good. That's awesome. We'll have to make sure this is 100% of the crowd. Well, I'm not going to tell you about AWS so much today. I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, data and the importance of data and leading with data. So, um, and we, we manage and store a lot of data at Amazon Web Services. And in fact, this year we launched, I don't know if any of you got a chance to come to our reInvent conference. Uh, at Las Vegas, we had about 32,000 people this year. So I guess that's, this is our mini Las Vegas now here in Washington, D.C. here, right? Um, but we, we had about 32, 34,000 people somewhere in there. And we launched something called the snowmobile. Uh, we, had, we had a snowball, and now we have a snowmobile. Uh, so I, I don't know what we're going to have next. Uh, what comes after a snowmobile? Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but this has 100 petabytes. It can store up to 100 petabytes of data. So you can just sort of pull it up, hook it up to your data center, pull, either utilize it as a processing, almost like an edge kind of program, or you can suck the data out into the snowball, snowmobile, and then put it back in uh, your data center or in the cloud. So multiple ways. But this is an example of how much we actually care about data and understand how important data is and, ha and having a program uh, that represents data. And in fact, it's still one of the number one things, believe it or not, with large enterprises that causes them to move slowly in getting to the cloud is the fact that they have a hard time getting their data moved. So this is one of the ways that we're actually helping them move that data uh, much faster through our snowmobile. Um, we do live in a data-driven world. And I know and understand most of you all are from the government sector. And I've been working with government now over 20 years. And in the last uh, six plus years, I've been going around the world and meeting and talking with governments. And this whole concept of transparency and open data and open government is really now a theme around the world. And I'm always surprised. like. A, when I go and I hear what are top issues, concerns, or needs of other governments, uh, data is, of course, one of the very first things that pops up. And you have things that are happening. There, there are world events that actually occur that make some countries change. Like, I'll give you an example, like Brazil. In Brazil, they had lots of issues with the corrupt government, impeachment of the president. And when I went and met with a lot of their leaders, the only thing they talked about was open data, transparency. How do they make things that they have more open and usable? And when you're living in a data-driven world and you need to unlock that data, you need to really understand a few things. One is, what do I actually have? What's the kind of data I actually have? Secondly, once I determine that data, how do I open it up and utilize it? I mean, how do I sort of observe it, look at it, feel it, understand it? And then how do I use it and assess and analyze impactfully? And then how do I share that in a way that makes the world a better place or, or for my mission or my program? How does it actually change things? How does it educate people? Uh, and when I talk about data in a sort of living in a data-driven world, um, you know, no longer do you have to sacrifice speed for security when it comes to your data. That's one of the, the big reasons for cloud. You can move fast, you can analyze, and you can have security around all this. And with our partner like Socrata, which I'm so excited with the work that they're doing, and I've been able to see it uh, firsthand, They've made a real commitment to the public sector space around what you can do with data. In fact, they just, I'll congratulate them, they just achieved one of our government competencies for AWS as a partner. So thank you for that, for doing that and taking that effort because it means a lot, I think, when people see that you understand how to use the AWS tools on the government side and you work so closely with us. And Kevin and I have talked a long time about sort of these data programs 
Because one of the other issues when you're living in a data-driven world, and I, we should probably say we live in a data-driven government, right? There's so many, uh, there's so many data sets, and they're they're sorted and looked at and uh, and managed in different ways. But when you live in this data-driven world, you really do have to have a program around it. And one of the concepts uh, for a long time that we talked about around data itself is how do you innovate with data? Well, I, I started thinking about this a lot when I would go around and talk to customers because they, they have data in government and they're very, as they should be, worried many times about the fact that the data has PII or specific information that they don't want to get out to other kinds of groups. And they're like, what do we do around that? What, how do we manage and how do we take advantage of that? Well, of course, there's processes and steps that you have to go through to scrub that data, be assured of what you can use data for and what you can't use data for. But in the early days, I'll share with you, at Amazon Web Services, uh, in December of 2010, when I sort of started this business uh, with Amazon, um, most customers did, really didn't understand how they would take advantage of data, but they knew they had an issue that they wanted to get this information out. And most of the early programs that we won in government, believe it or not, were data kinds of programs. And I'll give you an example. One was NASA. Uh, may, some of y'all have maybe heard the story. With NASA JPL, they had the Mars rover. And they came to us in the Mars rover uh, they had launched it, and it was actually only supposed to run around Mars for like six months. So this little rover was running around Mars, taking photographs, picking up uh, mineral, uh, dirt, whatever's on Mars. I haven't been there. I hope to go someday. But it was getting all this stuff, <laughs> streaming, having these amazing photographs streaming down from Mars. And it cost a lot of money, though, because they were streaming, they were storing, they were analyzing. And guess what? the rover just kept roving and roving and roving and roving. And they're like, we can't shut this down. This data is like amazing. And we want to share it with everybody, researchers, educational institutions. But what, what are we going to do? Our budget doesn't even begin to support this program. So they called us. And we worked with them in a very short period of time to begin to store the data in AWS, stream the data from Mars, store it in AWS, and then they started using the analytical tools. So now you can go online and use all this, and it's open to the world, and we have case studies about it, but they talk about their amazing savings, but also the amazing capabilities. And the reason I love that story is because it's tons and tons, petabytes of data now that's streaming down and being stored, but they've opened it up to the world. And the world now has the capability of looking at it and analyzing it. Another story the team uh, says to me many times that, um, I know they get tired of hearing it, but I love it because it was our first real opportunity to take data in the government in a very big way and showcase the fact that it could be used and crowdsourced by many and used to save the world, make the world a better place. Who knows about the Thousand Genome Project? So the Thousand Genome Project, we went to NIH and we said, hey, we'd like to take the Thousand Genome Project and put a copy of it in the AWS cloud. They were like, okay. I mean, nobody had, because people were coming to them all the time wanting to use that data. But of course, if you didn't have your own data center and you couldn't afford to go move that data, it was really expensive to go collect it. So we did it for free. We moved it on our own nickel, we put it in AWS, and we opened it up to the world. It's still up there. And we have, if you go to AWS, you can go look, there's lots of, of open and free data sets. But the first week that we put that up, uh, 3,200 new researchers crowdsourced on that data set. Now there's been thousands of articles written about it. Now we've moved on. Now we have the cancer data set. We have many, many more data sets. Uh, and even like with some of the work that Socrata is doing, you know, they're helping to hone in, analyze, and make this kind of data much better. So when you start or have your data program, which I really highly encourage you all to, to do, is set up a data program. Because um, Every agency or organization really needs to put a plan around their data. One is internal use, so sort of that open data internally and then open data externally. Because I'm a big believer, um, if you're trying to do intelligence 
or analytics, or you have different groups and teams if you're talking about justice and public safety, to defense or intelligence or air traffic control. You may have data sets that are closed to the world, but they're open to you. And then you make that even more granular. We call them data lakes and then data ponds. But data lakes, you make them more and more granular. So you have data lakes that you all use internally, but then when you decide you want to share them, you can share and open them up to groups or individuals internally you want to. So you can have what I called closed open data, or you can have open open data to the world. So you can sort of make a decision about how you want to do that. And that was impossible in the past. We have a few customers today that um, buy data sets, and they've said to me, we were buying like 50 copies of the same data set in, this, in the same agency. And they were all using it. And then they realized, well, wait a minute, why are we doing this? So think about a budgetary issue. They each needed it. They were all going out and buying it. When they could have bought it once and used it internally, it wasn't that their number of users were going up in any way. It was that they just kept buying the same data set and that nobody was sort of speaking to each other, or understanding the use cases for that. So now what we see them doing, they buy a data set and they have sort of an open data set with internal to their walls, but then they start petitioning it off for their own work and their own efforts. So Crata is working with the city of Chicago where they have um, from data from 2001 looking at crime incident reporting. And uh, now you can, um, different agencies, different groups, citizens can go in and take a look at those, those crime reports. And that's utilized a lot, we were sort of talking backstage. I think that's pretty, that's pretty typical, but sometimes the data's not there. It's not good data. And if you can continue to feed and get that information from justice and public safety resources, then as citizens, we can go in and crowdsource on it. Uh, the city of Singapore is another data set I talk about a lot, which uh, multiple agencies in Singapore came together to put their data so sets uh, in one so s people uh, exploring the city or citizens, tourists or citizens, can understand everything about the city. Where are the parks, what roads are blocked, what roads are open, what are the attractions, where are the schools, where are the hospitals. So you can sort of see everything. And these agencies work together to continue to not just update that, but they also work to see who's utilizing those data sets and what are they getting from those data sets. So again, you can begin to get more and more granular understanding what data sets are actually being used uh, for. And then, you know, data unlocks potential. I mean, one of the things I was just sharing is um, researchers, young students, professors, health uh, researchers, science researchers ar around the world talk about what they've learned and how much faster they can work now with uh, the tools and resources available through technology in the cloud. And, partners like Socrata who have really tools and resources to help you move faster. So in the world that we live in today, we're all pretty impatient, right? I'm impatient if my Amazon Prime movie or show, I'm, I'm, I'm doing collections right now. I, I just finished a couple others. When I'm ready to watch, I want to watch fast and I want to, I watch The Crown. I want it to move and if it doesn't respond to me really fast, I get super upset. And same with our data now, right? If we're trying to pull data, we want it to sort of move faster. We want to understand the knowledge behind that and then be able to share it out and utilize it much more rapidly. And with the resources today, um, I was, you know, this just happens to be a hurricane uh, here. And if you think about the data we have because of weather, uh, we have weather data sets. Uh, NextRad is a data set that we have on Amazon Web Services, and it's a really good example of, they told us, they did a case study with us, and they said internally, their internal resources have been used about 200 plus percent less, but their usage um, of that, I'm sorry, the usage of their data has gone up over 200 percent, but their internal resources costs have gone down by 50 percent. So think about that. So their data sets and what they have are being used a lot more, but their costs have gone down by 50%. And not only that, uh, the reason, another reason it unlocks potential, the data from NextRat is being used by weather channels and weather groups to create new tools and resources that they're monetizing. 
So that's just another example of how data itself is being used to actually force multiply and monetize what's out there. So data changes lives. Um, we are working with the American Heart Association. Nancy Brown is one of the most forward-leaning CEOs in the not-for-profit world I've worked with in a very long time. She's not technical, but she's visionary. And heart disease, strokes, heart disease, high blood pressure is the number one killer around the world still today, uh, around the world and growing in many parts of the world. So uh, the American Heart Association and Nancy are on a mission to change that. And she said, we need data because data is one of the most important things to help us get there faster. We've got to understand what we're doing and how we're doing it. And I don't know if any of you are physicians are in the room, but we had a, an amazing opportunity to be in with some of the best and brightest physicians in the world that are on her board, advisory board. And I learned a fact that I, that I didn't know, which they said, when you go into the ER for a potential heart problem, sometimes it's a lung problem and not a heart problem and vice versa. And because the, ta the data and the tools are still not honed in appropriately as they should be, as advanced as we are, there are decisions, life and death decisions that have to be made very rapidly. And sometimes they make the wrong one. Uh, they might have to treat heart and lung because they're not sure. And I had no idea the correlation of how, how closely related these kinds of symptoms were. But you learn a lot. And she said, but because we understand now through genotype and phenotype and other kinds of data sets that we're pulling in, we're learning a lot more and we're moving much, much more rapidly. And the statistics that they're pulling on decreased study time and time to innovation and time to cure, time to um, different types of uh, treatments is pretty amazing, I mean, pretty amazing. And that's what we hear over and over is things that now have taken three or four years or taken weeks. And that's like, that's amazing to me. And that's the power of data. That is the power of data. But in order to have that power of data, you really have to have programs in place that you utilize and understand that you have elements of training and education, tools assessment, what are the analytics that you're using? How do you communicate those out? How do you continue to adjust and share? But it's got to be sort of intentional with mechanisms placed around it. So, um, I, could, I could talk to you all day. I have so many great examples of, of, of data and open data. And it was, it was funny because when I was talking to you about the American Heart Association, another one that came to my mind is one, you go from human lives, of what we're talking about with heart disease, to actually agricultural, which uh, we work with another group in the Philippines called the International Rice Research Institute. And they have something called the 3000 rice genome. And a majority of the Asian population live off rice, but they're concerned more and more and more that a lot of the rice strands are going to become extinct. So they have started this institute to evaluate and understand uh, the rice genomes. You can go uh, look at that and understand that now. And it's, I just talked to the director about six months ago, and he said, since we have put this uh, rice genome data set up, we have had more support and more help around the world, and we've made more progress than we ever thought we would do that, you know, years. We thought it would take us years to get where we are. So they said, we, you know, it's good. Now we're having to rethink our entire strategy. And that's the reason a program is good to have, because if you achieve those goals, then you have to think bigger. You have to think bolder. How do I do now? How do I take my program to the next step? I was thinking it would be here. It's already here. Now what, I, what do I do with the program and how do I take it to the next steps? So I would challenge all of you today that are running data programs to think bigger because technology is not the problem anymore. It's really process culture, how you put it together, how you really put your uh, program effort in place. And we're here to help you. We want to support you. Amazon Web Services is here to support you in this. So CRADA, as one of our key partners in this space is here to support you. So while I know we're, we're sort of a smallish group today, I think next year this is going to triple in size because people are going to continue to see that we should be showing up here together to really display and understand and learn from each other on what we're doing with our data programs and force multiply this out along uh, government lines and other groups around the world that we could share with. 
So um, I want to thank you so much for allowing me to be here today. I have some of my team here. I know that we're going to have a reception later that they're going to be there. If there's anything we can help you with or questions that we can answer more, I didn't really go into who AWS is, but uh, we're happy to explore with you more and just uh, really happy to be here. So thank you guys. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.